Thank you so much. I considered uh, approaching the lectern uh, dancing Theresa May style, but I <laughs> thought that um, <laughs> we've seen enough of Theresa's dancing. Um, on a more serious note, thank you so much, Solomon, and it is wonderful to be here, but I do want to acknowledge um, as I start that my thoughts are very much with our colleagues who may be in the room uh, today from Mozambique, from Zambia, and from Zimbabwe, where uh, Cyclone Idai has, um, uh, has been devastating uh, and, when there, and where there is a, uh, an ongoing uh, emergency response. So I, I want to uh, indicate that we are thinking of them. Um, and I also want to offer a few words of special support to our brothers and sisters who are of the Muslim faith and to say that also I have been thinking very deeply about what's happening in New Zealand. If there are colleagues um, here who have traveled from there, that, that I am also thinking very much of what is happening there. So good afternoon. I am thrilled to close out what by all accounts has been an incredible conference. And I'm here to talk about stories. And I'm here to talk about how stories are made. While my remarks will be focused on international development uh, and the sector that you work in, I think they apply to a whole range of sectors, particularly the news media, literature, film, the whole story-making industry, as it were. As we all know, the depiction of the global south as a broken, static, and endlessly needy place is not a new phenomenon. The visual stereotypes of my continent, Africa, have existed for centuries. The people sitting in this room didn't create those stereotypes, but you certainly, I think, have a responsibility to think about how the stories you tell today either perpetuate or disrupt these powerful tropes. Challenging the endless stream of poverty porn, the ways in which the full humanity of black and brown people is constantly ignored, I think is crucial, of course. Changing these stories, though, Literally creating new stories and images won't happen if we just criticize. We have to look at how those stories are made, at who takes the pictures, at who tells the stories, and who we think those stories are intended to influence. I often ask, find myself asking when I see something particularly crazy, which is often in this day and age, who exactly are these stories for? Looking clearly at what African author Teju Cole has called the white savior industrial complex, at the systems that keep on replicating these stories and images is fundamental, I think, to addressing this ongoing challenge. It's obvious to me that if you want to move away from these exhausted narratives about poor third world people, you're going to have to invest in new storytellers. And you're going to have to sit still and listen without interjecting, as these storytellers tell the stories that they want to tell. And you're going to have to trust their judgment and their expertise and their capacity to imagine new futures. And this idea frightens, I think, many people and many organizations who have invested heavily in simplifying messages for audiences that are often overwhelmed, desensitized, and disengaged. And I think that's real. It's really important to acknowledge that that's real. Because investing in storytellers and de-emphasizing the key messages of your organizations, your storylines, means complicating the narrative. It means potentially sending mixed messages or contradictory ways of approaching the big questions that plague us, questions of climate change, of public health, of extractive industries, all of this work that we do. And I think it is right to be frightened, but I don't think we can let fear paralyze us. Courage is not easy, otherwise I think everyone would be brave, right? So expanding the pool of people who you draw upon to tell stories and broadening the scope of what a story looks like, I think ultimately is gonna be the only thing that saves all of us. Because I think without adapting, organizations like yours will struggle with legitimacy, you will struggle with connecting with people, and you'll struggle with reach. All of the tools that we so desperately require to end poverty, to end inequality, 
to challenge patriarchy, to defeat greed, and to ensure a sustainable future. But before we go into my clarion call for how we're gonna make better stories and build more respectful relationships with storytellers, I want to offer a, bis a bit of a disclaimer. I want to admit something. I am a bit ambivalent about the phrase storyteller. I'm ambivalent because the people that we tend to think about as storytellers um, are often from the third world. So we don't see them as being engaged in intellectual work and in the generation of knowledge, yeah? So the storyteller is a bit of a mystic, someone with ancient knowledge that is passed on through the spirits, an exotic kind of other. We think of storytellers as wise, right? The wise storyteller, rather than intelligent. Storytellers move you, experts make you think. White people are experts, brown and black people are, Storytellers. So I'm, a, I'm ambivalent about the phrase. Of course I'm a storyteller, and of course all of us are storytellers, but it's important to think critically about what lies underneath some of these ideas that we talk about without thinking. So this pernicious idea that third world storytellers speak with passion rather than intellect is clear when we think about how organizations like ours collect stories. Most of you get your stories from people who work on projects and programs based in the global south. And yet you rely on experts in your organizations to provide you with analysis. So you get stories from the field and you get expertise from headquarters. So when you need to capture your stories as images, you'll often send, you know, if you've got a lot of money, you'll send a, a good big name photojournalist to take pictures, right? And even when you use local photographers, they often mimic the tone and the style of the big shot photographers. So the outcomes, the way the stories look, are fairly predictable, yeah? No matter what the color of the person is who's taking the photos or writing the story. And so we repli replicate existing hierarchies of knowledge, we create the same images, and we double down on the idea that it's only appropriate for white and or Western educated people like myself to frame the issues, because they are smart and they know how to capture the feelings of black and brown people in ways that translate for Western audience. So certain people think and other people experience. Most importantly, I think, the stories that many of the organizations uh, that do work collected in this room today, um, the stories that many of you uh, collect are almost always narrowly defined. They're, these stories follow the same arc and they say the same things, albeit in different ways. Over and over again, NGOs tell us about the wonderful people in the field who are doing great work to change the world, right? None of these stories ever offer surprises or disrupt people's ideas about what it means to be from and live in the global south. So many of these stories lack the imagination and the dynamism that I see in abundance in my Africa. So the problem is not that I want to erase images of poverty. The problem is not simply about that phrase that we all know so well, the danger of a single story. The problem is that the means by which the story is produced is often hopelessly flawed. So I want to put it to you this way. Let's do a thought experiment. I want you to imagine that your organization is a factory, okay? And that the product that your factory manufactures is stories. The factory has clients and they place orders for stories. Some of these stories will be broadcast in the media, others will be used at big public events and conferences like this one. The factory sometimes produces its own stories, which it then distributes through its own channels. Still, the audience for the stories is always the same. Funders, potential funders, whether they be individuals or other organizations. Over time, the factory workers have developed a few systems. The stories they manufacture are always made to specification. The factory produces them essentially to order. 
the right length, the right format, the right colors, the right tones, etc. The raw material for the stories comes from the third world. It's shipped here to the UK via digitally encrypted files. There are still some stories that are harvested by hand when factory workers travel to the story fields and they meet with traditional story makers. And the stories that are produced in the story fields are artisanal. They often need to be processed once they arrive back here in the UK. On the one hand, the stories from the rich fields um, are very interesting. They're bespoke in a sense, but often they don't adhere to the specifications of the clients, which means that the factory workers worry that their stories will be rejected for non-compliance. They don't meet, I had to make a Brexit joke, they don't meet EU standards. <laughs> so there's a unit in the factory that provides technical assistance to the story growers. This is a very time intensive process, but it works. It essentially entails drip feeding the story makers with ideas and inputs so that the outcomes of the stories that they make, the shape and the variety, conform to what the clients want. You see the point I'm making. Even when the stories that we are telling appear to have been sourced outside of headquarters, they often actually haven't. The engine room for the vast majority of stories that we tell are, is internal. The stories are driven by our need to fundraise from institutional donors and from Western publics. And I sympathize with this, but it has implications. It means the stories speak directly to what you think these constituencies want to hear. There's nothing wrong with this necessarily, but it just isn't storytelling. It's story making, it's story creation, it's public relations, it's marketing. Storytelling is rich with context. It's not interested in branding, and it's almost always unpredictable. It's a different beast altogether. Nigeria, British Nigerian author Ben Okri says that a story is the answer to a question, and that somehow all the stories we tell are really attempts for us to work out the issues that matter to us and to provide ourselves with those answers. In other words, stories aren't neutral. So I have spent most of my life working in organizations like yours. And so I know it's hard to have to report and document and monitor and evaluate and tell stories that will be understood and digested by people who operate in completely different contexts. I get it. By the end of my tenure in formal development work, which was a long time ago now, I had become the executive director of a regional foundation. I oversaw a staff of 100 people. We had a budget of $50 million. We worked across 10 countries, one of which was the Congo, another of which was Zimbabwe, at times when both those countries go were going through significant challenges. And so because we were a sophisticated and predominantly African team, we never told stories about our grantees and collaborators as victims, right? Instead, our case studies and our bulletins focused on community mamas, hardworking youth, you know the ones I'm talking about, right? We all know those great stories that we like to tell. We told stories about individual agency. But over time, I began to see that somehow all of our stories seemed to have the same arc. They always started when our funding began. <laughs> and miraculously, they all ended when the problem was solved, which somehow seemed to coincide with when our grant support ended. In other words, they weren't real stories. How could they be when they so precisely matched our project cycles? We were driving the logic of the story without even knowing it. We were the story factory. We were shaping their narratives to suit our own objectives, and we thought that we were being empowering. In reality, of course, the problems our projects were designed to address often started long before we arrived and persisted long after we left. So we were feeding the beast, trying to simplify. And in the process, I knew that some of the stories we were collecting for communities weren't actually true. They weren't lies, but they reflected what we wanted to hear. Our colleagues and communities knew that saying good things, positive things, 
would help us to get more funding and this in turn would have benefits for them. And many of the good things they said were true, right? But they understood our story very, very well. And they knew about where their story fit in to the manufacturing process. So they understood that we were commodifying their stories, selling narratives to audiences that wanted to hear certain things. They knew the questions we were trying to answer, and they knew we were interested in one story. And it was a story about us, not a story about them. And so it was increasingly obvious to me that inspiring poor black and brown people that I met in my daily life um, were good enough for case studies and for free blogs while the stories of inspiring white Westerners were far too good to be given away for free. These stories of white people with hearts of gold were turned into Hollywood scripts. They were converted into lucrative book deals, while the stories of black and brown people were being harvested for free. And over time, I began to realize that I wanted to write and I wanted to talk about the work and the ideas of third world philosophers, doctors, community people, all the people I was interacting with. So when somebody cites Jeffrey Sachs, I wanted them to instead to read Tandika Mkandawire. Instead of Sheryl Sandberg, I wanted journalists to interview Amina Mama or Sylvia Tamale or any number of the other African feminists who exist. So I wanted to tell and amplify stories differently. So today I work at the intersection of storytelling and social justice. I work at this wonderful place in Australia, very far away, called the Center for Stories. And I have, in the last few years, told, helped to tell scores of stories, and I train storytellers. We help to bring first-person true stories to life, and I specialize particularly in oral storytelling. Because all of our stories, regardless of their content, are subtle and they're nuanced and they're resistant to categorization, and none of them are ever told in order to inspire anybody. Good stories are true and they're compelling, but that's it. More importantly, good stories surprise us and they teach us something. And this doesn't happen by coincidence. It happens when storytellers, not stories, are valued. So I want to end my remarks by telling you about one of my favorite stories. So I will tell you a story. A woman I will call Haywat. Haywat walked into the Center for Stories a few years ago. Every month we have this event called Food for Thought, where we host a storyteller who tells a story and we eat. We break bread together. And so people come and there's a three-course meal from the country where the storyteller is from. So Haywat uh, and I met a few weeks in advance of the of her storytelling evening, uh, and I typically sit on this blue couch in our office, and the storyteller sits down, and, they, and I listen. They tell the whole story, and then I give them tips about how they can refine their story, and I have a few principles and guides that we use. So she started to tell me about um, uh, where she grew up and how she left Ethiopia when she was 19 years old. But then she reached a certain point in the story, and she started to cry. She couldn't continue. So the events that she was describing had happened 30 years ago, but it was still very difficult for her to talk about. So she just stopped. She couldn't continue to tell the story. Okay. So she would cry, and then I would change the subject. We would talk about all these other things, and then time would be up, and she would go. And she came back. Same thing. And I would cry, and she would cry, and we, you know, she'd tell me about her mother and her sisters and all these other stories about what was happening in her life that week. But we were not progressing on the story at all. So I'm starting to get a bit worried that we're, we're running out of time. So finally it occurred to me to ask her, what was so important about the journey that she felt that she needed to talk about? Yeah, what is it that you're trying to say in the story? What's so important in the journey? And she looked at me blankly and she said, nothing. She said, I thought that's what you wanted to hear about. Because it's an evening where everyone comes and they listen to stories about refugees, and I'm a refugee. So I thought they would want to hear how I came here. Tell us your story. And we laughed, and both of us felt very relieved because there was absolutely no need for her to talk about her journey to Australia. I wasn't interested, and no one in the room was forcing us for her to tell that story. 
Let's tell another story, I suggested. What do you want the people who are in the room to know about you, I asked. And she said, without even having to think about it, she said, that I miss home. Because in 20 years of her being in Australia, whenever people met her and found out she was from Ethiopia, they would say to her, oh wow, you're so lucky to be here. Because they imagined the worst, because the very idea of Ethiopia was fixed in their mind as a particular kind of place. And she wanted them to know how much of her that erased and diminished, how many stories and memories she had to swallow how much history and culture were swept under the rug with those six words, you are so lucky to be here. And so since we both realized that I wasn't asking her to tell a story about being a refugee, and I didn't care, she was free to tell a story that to this day is one of my favorite stories that a storyteller has ever told me. It was a gorgeous story about growing up and the Ethiopian New Year celebrations they had every year. And it was hilarious, and her father would give her mother perfume every year, and she would act like she was completely surprised that he gave her the same perfume every year. And she would spray it all over, and she would spray, spray, spray so much, and he, she would spray it on the children as blessings, and then he would say, hey, do you think I got this perfume from the river? Um, so it was a beautiful, lovely, subtle, warm story. It was a universal story. And the people who listened that evening came away knowing more about Ethiopia, more about its culture and history than they ever would have if she had told us a painful story of her departure and arrival in Australia at a time when her country was on its knees. More importantly, she was proud of herself, and every African in that room was too. So Hayward reminded me that my duty is always to the storyteller, never to the story. If you take care of the storyteller, the stories will come. She reminded me that the best stories are told from our scars, not from our wounds. That if we are still in pain, we need to protect ourselves. Her story illustrates the powerful difference between vulnerability and exposure. To be vulnerable is beautiful. To be exposed, to feel exposed is a shame. And I insist that my storytellers speak from strength, not fear, shame, or insecurity. Your work is hard, but it can be much easier if you close the story factories that you are currently running and free the stories. Support storytellers, your partners, your grantees, to tell stories about themselves and what they know, not about their projects. Let them determine the public agenda, and I guarantee that people will connect with your issues. Because that's why people tell stories, because they're public intellectuals, because they want to influence the public agenda. So I want to close with the words of the great Arunati Roy, who is one of my favorite, who in one of my favorite stories, The God of Small Things, because fiction matters too, writes, it is after all so easy to shatter a story, to break a chain of thought, to ruin a fragment of a dream being carried around carefully like a piece of porcelain. To let it be, to travel with it, is the much harder thing to do. Do the harder thing. Let the stories be. I thank you.